So we've got Tim Miller, who is a professor at University of Kansas. Tell us a little about what you're what you're teaching over there. The basics. Who do you represent in the in the educational context? Well, my field broadly is American religious history, and what I am interested in and teach as much as I can is is things that are outside the mainstream. Um, I'm really interested in the groups that go against the flow, and that's that's what I teach more than anything else. And in the course of that, I started out in the 1970s, 80s teaching quite a bit about what we call new religious movements, the things that some people call cults, a word that I don't care for, and because it's basically hateful language, but uh, that's what I started out with, and then I got more and more interested in, in documenting the history of American communal living. I think the reason why I got that particular interest going within this larger world of the thousands of religious movements we have in this country is that in communities, intentional communities, people are really committed. They really have thrown everything they've got into it. Um, religion in America, I think, is tremendously cheap. It's very, very easy to say, I believe, and this is, this is my commitment, this is what I do, and by golly, I go to church every Sunday, and I give them $5 a week, and this is really commitment. It's not commitment, it's cheap. Uh, in many cases, I mean, not that there aren't committed people, but it's cheap, it's easy to get into that world. Whereas communal living, this is like you've said, I'm giving it all I've got, I'm throwing it all in, because I do believe that people ought to be pursuing a goal in this, at this serious level. The goal can be a lot of different things. It can be religious commitment, often is, uh, but it can be something else. It can be saving the planet. A lot of people see this as a vehicle for environmentalism or all kinds of other things. So you've seen people come together communally in, in almost that religious sort of spiritual sense where they've come together, they've given, they've gone all in. Can you tell us about some of the magic that comes from that, the inspiration that you've seen in the people who are doing it and living passionately, communally? Well, I just think mostly they feel like they've given their lives to a good cause mm -hmm. and they are, um, they're working it out in various ways. Um, uh, I mean, there are a lot of different, different things you can focus on. I'm not sure exactly how Well, I'm looking for the question. inspiration. I'm looking for the magic, maybe some examples or, or facets of the lifestyle that keeps these people motivated to stay in and makes it all worthwhile. What's, what's the magic in the commune? The magic, well, yeah. part of it is just fun of, of being around other like-minded people all the time. I mean, that's pretty nice. Uh, we spend a lot of our time with people we don't know, we don't have much feeling for. Um, and there you're really in an environment of people who think like you do, at least ideally. Uh, you also, there's a real feel that you're going to make a difference. I mean, that, that's kind of the underlying drive, I think. Uh, there are different ways you might make that difference, but today a lot of communities are environmental in nature. They see a planet as just rolling off the edge of the cliff, and this is maybe a way we can attack that. Um, in, inherently, communal living of any kind is a step in that direction because of the efficiencies of communal living itself. If you have, well, Twin Oaks community in Virginia, uh, about 100 people, and I think they have around 12 or 15 cars, that's enough, that's all you need. Um, so instead of having 100 cars, they've got a few. I mean, where's the environmental gain there? There's a big environmental gain. Um, and this, th th that just is repeated throughout. You don't need all of this stuff that we have you don't need the energy consumption that we have. You can live a perfectly satisfactory life on a lower level, and but in communal living, you do. It's just part of the animal. So of the communes that you've been exposed to, who have been successful, who have stood the test of time, mm -hmm. what's been the key to their success, or the keys you know, that you could point out? I wish I could answer that. One, yeah. one thing I'm convinced of is that there's no one answer to any question like that. There are, there are flukes of history, there are flukes of nature, 
Uh, some things hit where other things that look very similar don't hit. Mm. Um, obviously, the people have to get along at a high level. If you don't have that, you've got nothing. But um, I think there are a lot of factors come into play. Uh, I think why do some communes not last very long? A lot of them don't. Uh, one reason is money. Um, you have to have money no matter how efficient your lifestyle is. You've got to have money. Some of them just can't make it financially. So money can make a, make a real difference. It can really make things work or not work. Uh, having a good communal business that works somehow and presumably is doing some good for the planet usually, that's, that's one thing. Uh, or having an angel. A fair number of communities have someone who is really committed and says, okay, I've inherited some money and this is where it's going to go. I think this is the best thing to do with it. Mm -hmm. That happens when I started working on this seriously 20 or 30 years ago. I was kind of skeptical of that. I thought, well, maybe occasionally, but I can't think very many people would do that. Surprisingly, many have done that. Uh, there are people who simply say, no, this I want to go all in and this is what I'm going to do with it. So, yeah, things like that. What percentage would you say of the communes you've experienced are, are well-funded, well-resourced? <laughs> well, most are not. Right, I figured. <laughs> but you say it as if, oh, there are plenty who have plenty of money or angels. There, there are some who, who uh, have money or at least have the facilities that they need. Uh, sometimes just someone donates land, but that's a big chunk of itself. I mean, if you can get land and you have the ability to build the, uh, the buildings you need, the humble structures that you need to survive, which don't have to be expensive. I mean, our, our American way of living is not required. We don't have to have all the creature comforts. Um, you can actually do pretty well. Uh, you don't have to have a massive income to make it work. You do have to have some money. Hard to live without some. Um, some communities work out a very nice business that just serves them well. Uh, there's a small community in Northern California that has a plumbing business and they go do plumbing jobs and they do just fine. They're quite prosperous. So different things. Are many, I'm, I'm interested in resourcefulness and self-sustainability, are many of these communes doing energy generation? Do many of them solar? Anyone have a wind, you know, a, a windmill? Or? There's more and more work in alternative energy. An awful lot of communes are interested in that. It takes a while to get that all worked out a lot of times, but I think they're moving rapidly in that direction. A lot of building today, uh, solar panels are everywhere in the communal world. Okay. Um, there is wind in many cases. There's a community in Scotland called Findhorn, uh, kind of a new age spiritual community. And they have some large, for, for a commune, large wind generators, uh, real big windmills on the North Sea, lots of wind blowing in all the time. And they have, um, they claim, I've, I've seen this analysis, which was not done by them, done by other people that says, as a group, they have the smallest environmental, smallest carbon footprint of any organized society in the developed world. Um, they just live they, they produce energy and they don't consume much. What a beautiful thing. More of that, yeah. please, right? How about as far as I know there are eco-villages, et cetera, is permaculture often being incorporated into the commune? Yeah, per permaculture is very popular. People work, permaculture kind of means different things. It works out in different ways, but yes, very popular. Uh, count the number of people who go to permaculture workshops and try to learn what it's all about. Lots and lots of them do, yeah. Do you see Okay, let me, there's that concept of the hippie utopia. Sure. Do, you, do, do you see some utopia out there in the communes? Well, utopia is what you make it. If you're really doing what you want in life, I mean, how much better do you get than that? Um, utopia is a funny word in our society. It's thrown around in funny ways, I think. Uh, it means for a lot of people kind of pie in the sky, it's unrealistic, it's a dream maybe, and it's done by silly people who don't get reality. And that to me is not what utopianism is at all. Utopianism to me is imagining something better. It's dreaming, if you will, it's, it's vision. And uh, communal living almost inherently is, has that. Do you see a lot of love on the communes? Sure, yeah. And if you have a good compatible group of people, um, which is pretty essential. Um, you, you must like a, any relationship. Over time, it can really deepen. If you want it to deepen, it can do it. 
and a lot of communal relationships do. It sounds like such a beautiful thing, and I, we've never really v actually visited and gone on and, and yeah. seen how things operate and met people, so we're excited to do that as well. And um, hopefully it's in the communal spirit as well, but we always love to wrap with a hug. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>